It's late February 2024 and I'm up and about just as the sun is starting to rise. By nature, I'm a night owl. I like the dark, the quiet of the witching hour, the stillness of the world when the sun is going down and almost everybody else is asleep. I've been this way since I was a little kid, which was incredibly inconvenient for everybody else. But as an adult, I've leaned into it. Apart from on those days when I have to get up at the crack of dawn to travel into university in London. Because we live rurally, it's a long journey. And all through the winter, I've been getting up into pitch blackness. The ground has been covered in ice sometimes and it has been treacherous to walk down the hill to the bus stop. Thankfully though, things have started to change and as I walk down this same route, the sun has started to rise earlier and earlier, meaning I am now able to walk right through the chittering and tweeting of the dawn chorus. This is cheering on one level, because spring is clearly on its way, but on another it's got me thinking. Because having walked this route in the pitch black so many times, I can pretty much do it with my eyes closed. And if I do close my eyes and let the sounds of the world surround me, even after just a few moments I can feel my other senses heightening. It's a well-observed phenomenon that losing one sense can make the others work over time, unlocking gifts others can't access. And in times gone by, people were inclined to believe that these gifts were supernatural. Sometimes even powers granted by the devil. With this thought in mind, gather close around the Three Ravens campfire and listen in. Welcome to the Three Ravens Podcast. There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast? Take with a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the Three Ravens podcast. My name's Martin Vaux. I'm a writer, storyteller and English romanticism obsessive. And I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in crime and all dark arts, Eleanor Conlon. Hello and episode 38, our second to last historic county of our first lap around England. I know, it's crazy. We've nearly gone around the whole nation. We've learned so much. We really have, but we haven't been alone and the rest of the Three Ravens community has joined us on the way. Speaking of which, we have some new supporters on Patreon to thank Nicole and Andy. All hail Nicole, King of Patreon. All hail Andy, King of Patreon. Thank you both for joining our Conspiracy of Ravens on Patreon. And if you, dear listener, are not already a member, then please do sign up. It helps us afford books, go on trips and keep the lights on. And once you're a member, it unlocks ad-free listening, early access to episodes, our stories as text versions, exclusive episodes each month, and episodes of the Three Ravens Film Club. Our new February Film Club episode comes out this Thursday, in fact, and it's all about the 1984 horror fairy tale mashup, The Company of Wolves. Mm -hmm. So that's the same day as our final bonus episode for Series 3, which is all about Leap Day. Not only that, but on Friday, it's also the 1st of March, which means we'll be releasing a brand new edition of the Three Ravens newsletter for our supporters on Patreon, packed with the historic folk customs for March, a new tarot spread, magic spell, zodiac and Celtic tree information, cultural recommendations and more. So for all that and access to our complete archive of all past episodes, do sign up if you haven't already at patreon.com forward slash three Ravens podcast. Right then, we are releasing this episode on Monday the 26th of February which is a nothing day. But Uh. yesterday, 
February 25th used to be a quite important one, as it was St. Valberga's Day. Oh, yes, St. Valberga. She was one of those Anglo-Saxon goddesses made into a saint, wasn't she? She was. Originally, she was Valborg, also known as Hulda, and she was the god most closely associated with witches. This is so inspiring to me, this whole story. Yeah, it's hella cool, because we know from the 10th century canon episcopy and from some 8th century writings that Valborg, or Hulda, was basically a kind of witch god. Alas, we don't know a whole load about her, but our best guess is that she's much like the Kalich, the Celtic old woman deity who flies about on her broom, spreading frost during winter, transforming into animals and generally being the protector of nature throughout those dark months. Yeah, the Kalich kind of represents the death of the year in a way, but she can transform into animals, particularly horned animals like deer and cattle, Mm -hmm. and she's written about as the veiled one. That's right. She also has a magic magic hammer with which she can shape the landscape. And it's said that on the night of February 25th into February 26th, women would slip from their homes, leaving their husbands sleeping, to join Valborg, or Hulda, this divine hag, becoming the Valborgen, or Huldan, this group of witches or female spirits who would fly off into the sky, travelling great distances, enjoying feasts and fighting battles in the heavens. Well, Valborg herself, you to fly on a distaff, didn't she? She did. And I think it's probably part of the classic witch imagery people don't really think about. What with witches thought to have these lengths of wood pointed out between their legs. The silhouette obviously implies these women were no longer quite looking like women and instead have these well, I'm not going to spell it out. It's a family podcast. Green sticks look a bit like very long penises. Okay, cool. You just went there. Well, let's not beat about the bush so to speak. (laughs) Oh dear. Anyway, those pesky Christians, when they came along, they changed Valborg into St. Valberga, who was said to be a holy maid from Devon in Somerset with healing hands. If you look at her in art, she normally has her hands all bandaged up. Anyway, she was, according to the church, a talented seamstress and missionary who travelled to Germany, founding monasteries, and was a witch hunter. This is seriously uncool. Yeah, it's about as uncool as it gets, I'd suggest. This transition began in the 8th century under Pope Adrian II, with St. Valborg's Day eventually shifting from the 25th of February to April 30th, the night before May Day. And today we call this Valpurgis, the night many still associate with witches meeting and having their annual ceremonies as a coven. But for hundreds of years, the night was more closely associated with witch hunting. Yeah, now it was traditionally believed that Valborg or Hulda's night was the point in the year when a witch's magic was at its strongest. And this belief lasted through into the medieval and Renaissance eras when witches were known to celebrate their Sabbath on Valpurgis. Night. From the 9th century, this began a move to the night before May Day with the Beltane fires and so on, which were seen as holy fires warding off evil. And with St. Valberg being a saint associated with witch hunting, those fires then became, in some places, handy fires on which to burn witches. Yeah, horrendous. So I suggest we try to untangle some of this mess. Valpurgis Night may be today much more of a positive night for witches to celebrate their Sabbath, but At the very least, we should spare a thought today for all the witches burned by nasty villagers across the centuries. And perhaps, I might argue, we should consider re-enshrining the 25th of February as Old Valberg's Night and 26th February as Valborg's Day. Because, before the church got involved, this was a very important and magical time. Hey, you have no arguments for me. Wait, what's that rumpus I can hear? Oh Oh, no, it's the county criers. (sighs) They've got their broomsticks and their... well... They're wangling them about between their legs in a manner most uncouth. How shocking. Well, should we try and pry our besoms away and have them ring us into Hertfordshire? Definitely. Now come here, you lot. That's my broomstick. No, I need it. Give it back. How else am I going to get to work tomorrow?
Hertfordshire is located in the east of England. It's bordered by Cambridgeshire to the northeast, Essex to the east, Greater London to the south, making it one of the home counties, Buckinghamshire to the west, and Bedfordshire to the northwest. As always, there's a map showing its precise location in England, along with expanded information about the things we'll be talking about today on the blog at threeravenspodcast.com. OK, help me out, Martin. I'm absolutely certain I have spent time in Hertfordshire, but I feel a bit lost. (laughs) Which are the famous towns or cities in the county? Well, there's only one city in Hertfordshire, and that's St Albans. Well, I've heard of it, but I haven't been there. Well, St Albans is a cathedral city. In population terms, fewer than 80,000 people live there. Otherwise, the county includes towns, including the county town of Hertford, the largest town in the county, Watford, and other towns such as Hemel Hempstead, Stevenage, and not one, but two garden cities, Letchworth and Welland Garden City. Well, that's super interesting because garden cities are something people maybe don't know that much about. Totally fascinating project. Yeah, they came about out of the utopian movement in the late 19th, early 20th centuries with this man, Sir Ebenezer Howard, designing these towns that were supposed to offer ideal ways of living. The whole of each garden city was intended to provide everything a community needed to live a healthy, happy life, with the idea being that once these pre-planned towns filled up to a population of 58,000 people, a new garden city would then be built nearby, connected to it, and eventually you'd end up with this whole network of interconnected utopian towns. It's a noble aim, and they are nice places, very pretty, and the idea did spread, didn't it? Oh, it went global. The model ended up being used all over the world, from North and South America to Africa, Asia, and in Australia and New Zealand. But in almost all cases, rather than building new neighbouring towns, green spaces in those towns were eventually developed. Problems also started to come about around ghettoization in some places, and the whole Garden Cities movement was kind of replaced by the idea of suburbs. But if you live in a suburb and feel like you lack access to a doctor or shops or public transport, Sir Ebenezer Howard is likely in his grave right now, nodding and wagging his finger, saying, well, I did not tell you so, didn't I? Eh? I gave you the model, but you ignored me. Okay, so take me back to the beginning. Does Hertfordshire appear in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for example? It does. Hertford was initially a fortress constructed by Edward the Elder, King of the Anglo-Saxons, named because it was a deer crossing, hence Hartford. Does that mean there's a deer on the flag? Oh yes, a noble stag having a nice little lie down against blue wavy lines representing water. That water symbolises the River Lee, where Hartford was built at a ford, where the rivers Mimram, Bean and Rib all meet. Very nice. In 1066, the Normans replaced the old fortress with a brand spanking new castle, Hartford Castle, though sadly that was knocked down and replaced with a rather grand country house in the 18th century. It's still called Hartford Castle and does have older bits, a Tudor gatehouse and so on, and it was one of the places Elizabeth I lived before she became queen. Though, even today, it remains in private hands. Well, so can people visit? Nope, but it's available for private hire. So yeah, peasants, keep your dirty hands off. It's like a bit of a shame. It does, but you know, with all those rivers, plus the River Colm, and its fairly central location, Hertfordshire has been a popular place for human habitation since ancient, ancient times. I know the deep past freaks you out a bit, but there's ancient stone and flint tools found in Hertfordshire dating back 350,000 years. Nah, 350,000 years is just too old. Yeah, it's long before any modern Britons lived here. In the intervening years, all the British Isles and Northern Europe were covered in ice during various ice ages. But we can confidently say that the town of Ware in Hertfordshire has been inhabited for over 12,000 years. What? Yep, it's thought to perhaps be the most consistently occupied human settlement settlement in all of Europe. They've done excavations there and found all sorts from farming enclosures and long barrows to, very interestingly, an ancient dog cemetery. Sorry, a dog cemetery? Yep, a whole massive Mesolithic burial complex 
dedicated to <laughs> docks. And as you go through time, there's evidence of roundhouses, Bronze Age tools, the whole shebang. It was occupied by our friends, the Catavalone tribe, their name meaning Masters of Battle. Love that. Very powerful. Yep, very powerful. And uh, that's the same tribe that ruled much of Sussex and battled Julius Caesar. Way back in episode one, you told a story about Devil's Dyke, this huge earthwork fortress. I did indeed. The story goes that the devil tried to dig it out in a single night. Yeah, well, it actually has a partner fortress in Hertfordshire, Beach Bottom Dyke, with these two dikes marking the military centres for the Catavalone, whose territories stretched right up from the south coast into the regions north and east of the Thames. Blimey. I mean, that's a huge ancient empire, mm -hmm. which would suggest to me that Hertfordshire must have been pretty wealthy. Well, interestingly, it seems like because of all of the rivers and what was once quite boggy soil, not that many people lived in Hertfordshire for quite a long time, by which I mean several millennia. You know, really quite a long time. But once the Romans rolled through and built a new fortress over the old Catavalonite capital at Verlamian, near what is now St Albans, and others at Tring, Wheathamstead, Wellen, Brawhing and Bulldog, suddenly Hertfordshire became this booming centre for Iron Age life. It's very interesting. And as a consequence, have there been lots of archaeological finds in Hertfordshire? An incredible number. It's kind of the heart of Iron Age study in England. And because the ancient trackway, the Icknield Way, runs through the county, from Wiltshire through to Buckinghamshire via the Chiltern Hills and Berkshire Downs, plus it was on both those major Roman roads Roads, Watling Street and Ermine Street. It was super important and digs in Hertfordshire have uncovered all sorts of stuff from 350,000 years ago right through to today. Gosh, so not necessarily always the richest county but definitely strategically important and with a super rich heritage. Most definitely. They are constantly finding new things. Burial grounds, coins, sculptures, coloured glass. There's over 25 museums in the county from the Welland Roman Baths to Hartford and North Hertfordshire Museum. On and on. There's a whole website hertfordshiremuseums.org.uk where they try to keep track of them all but it's unruly. The internet cannot contain the sheer amount of history in Hertfordshire. Amazing. Well this county seems like it has a heck of a lot going for it. But let's not muck about Martin. You know what gets me really excited <laughs> and that's castles, oh, right, yeah. cathedrals and abbeys. <laughs> so, what does Hertfordshire have on offer? Well, castles wise, alas, there isn't a whole ton. There's the ruins of Berkhamsted Castle. They're managed by English heritage and, and quite good. Then there's the ruins of London Gate and Waitmore Castle. But really, grand edifice wise, you've got Hatfield House. I knew I'd been to Hertfordshire. Yeah, that's I've it. been to Hatfield House. Epic Jacobean House, owned by the Cecil family, the other place where Elizabeth but the first really grew up. Plus this Nebworth house, this gothic Tudor house, which is insanely cool, and some rather pretty Georgian houses as well. But yes, I mean, why should we talk about any of this when there's St Albans to discuss? Yes, St Albans, an ancient Roman town. It's supposedly incredibly beautiful, tons of history, but most importantly, home to St Albans Cathedral. That's right. And what a cathedral it is is. As we've travelled around the country doing Three Ravens, we've spoken about 30 of England's 32 cathedrals. This will make 31. Yes, last one coming next week, Norwich Cathedral, which is also super beautiful. It is, but St Albans Cathedral claims to be England's longest cathedral. It's debated whether Winchester or St Albans is actually the longest, but Let's let them work it out between them, you know. I think they should just have a big fight. Did you? Yeah, get the bishops and the priests in the full regalia and settle things like they did in the old days with a massive brawl. Well, in lieu of that, I suggest we just let St Albans say that at 85 metres long, it has the longest nave of any cathedral in England. It was first built in the 8th century on the site of a shrine to St Alban, the first ever British martyr who died in the 3rd century. Yeah, famously 
see Alban was beheaded by Romans yeah. and the cathedral stands to this day where his head rolled down the hill and a spring bloomed out of the earth. Yeah, super cool story. And King Offa built a double monastery there, which was then turned into a cathedral by the Normans. It was enhanced again and again over the centuries, but was in a very bad way by the 19th century. It was then significantly repaired and quote unquote improved. If you get the chance to go, definitely do. Not least because it's a really strange cathedral. It is. You have history and architecture from what? 1700 years of English culture mm -hmm. all kind of mishmashed and blended <laughs> in together. Some of it is, well, a little bit garish, yes. but some of it's completely magical. Most definitely. And there were 35 different abbeys and priories in Hertfordshire, including a number of Templar houses, until roughly, alas, the dissolution of the monasteries came along, care of Henry VIII. Oh, his <laughs> Now, most of them were completely knocked down or adapted to other purposes. A lot are now country houses and so on. But Sopwell Nunnery ruins, also in St Albans, are definitely worth a look. OK, enough with the stones, bones and stately homes. <laughs> the name of my next podcast. Give me stories, Martin. I want weird and chilling tales. Gizm. OK, it would be my pleasure. But just to say, for our second lap around the country, you are going to have so much to talk about to do with Hertfordshire. The county's history is incredibly rich. As for its stories, though, let's start with the Wicked Lady, England's only recorded female highwayman. Shouldn't that technically be highwaywoman? Maybe. I think that because there's only one, they call her a female highwayman. Only one they've caught, Martin. That's true. Only that's one they've true. Caught. But highwaywoman does work just as well. Either way, her name was Catherine Ferrers, and she lived in the 17th century. Her family, the Fanshaws, were famous supporters of the royalist cause, meaning that, despite being born into wealth, during the Civil War, when her husband went off to fight in it, and after the Civil War, well, basically, she was stripped of her assets, so turned to crime. No way, this is great. Yep. So she was known to terrorise No Man's Land Common and the surrounding area around Weathamstead. In addition to robbing travellers, she was said to have burned houses, stolen and slaughtered livestock, and killed a constable or other officer of the law. She did all this in disguise, but was eventually shot herself and died of her wounds. Wow, I mean, she's surely ripe for having her life turned into a TV show or a film. Well, during the 20th century, there was a popular novel and then two films based on her life. 1945's The Wicked Lady, which was, and check this, the most successful film of all time when it came out. Wow. A big hit. And they made another one in 1983 starring Faye Dunaway. But feels to me it's about time someone took another bite at that cherry. Most definitely. Come on, the wicked lady. She sounds great. Better yet, her ghost is still known to haunt No Man's Land Common, sometimes on horseback, sometimes not. So, if you can't wait for a TV adaptation, just head out there on a cold, dark night and she might just ride up and introduce herself. Uh, no, thank <laughs> you. Her uh, ghost can stay in the TV, thanks. <laughs> OK, but Hertfordshire isn't short of legendary outlaws. It's time, Eleanor. I hoped it a bit at the end of last week's episode. Let's talk about Jacko Legs. Yeah, this is a ridiculous sounding hero. Did you say he was a giant? Yeah, his grave is visitable. His body was said to be buried at Holy Trinity Church in Weston, where there's a plaque showing where he lies with his head and feet marked by stones 14 feet apart. Wait, this is all sounding like he really existed. Did he really exist? I mean, look. I'm going to say he definitely existed because until it's proven that anything doesn't exist, I'm willing to go with it. And in this instance, Jacko Legs was basically supposed to be a woodwose, a giant wild man of the woods who lived in a cave near Bulldog. He was said to be a talented archer and hunter known to the local people with whom he had a friendly relationship. It said people would try and pull the string on his huge bow, but that it was far too big and heavy for any normal person to manage it. Only 
he fell foul of the Knights Templar. What? The Templars? <laughs> Where do they come into it? Well, the Templars used to control the price of flour in the area, and a time came where they raised the price of flour well above what the local people could afford. And as people probably know, the Templars were famed bankers as well. You could put money into a Templar bank in England and remove it in Jerusalem, for example. They were a powerful, very careful organisation. And not the kind of people you want to get in trouble with. No, and yet this giant wild man, Jack O'Legs, agreed with the local people that what were the Templars doing all this wrong stuff, making things too expensive and so on, he would ally with them and then he set about raiding and stealing from the Templars. Oh, it's, nice. it's kind of like a wood was Robin Hood. Yep, only seemingly older, dating from roughly the 13th century, so a hundred years or so before we get the first written references to Robin Hood. Alas, the Templars did eventually catch up with him and kill him, but still, local hero and genuine giant Jacko Legs. How about that one? That's excellent. And I'm guessing, I'm hoping, he's called Jack o Legs literally because he had really long legs. Yep, big old legs like tree trunks, apparently. <laughs> and if you're going to visit his grave, do also pop into Minsden Chapel, which is a ruined 14th century church that's super duper haunted. Haunted how? I mean, is this a typical case of ghostly monks and that sort of thing? Well, there is a ghostly monk, but he's not necessarily a medieval one. Go on. Okay, so rumours of the strange goings on at Minsden Chapel go back quite quite a long way. It's been falling apart since the 17th century, but a local lawyer, Reginald Hine, who lived in nearby Hitchin, became obsessed with this chapel, and he and his friend Thomas Latchmore were eminent folklorists and historians in the local area. In fact, Hines founded Hitchin Museum and wrote an excellent book about the folklore of the town and was planning one about Hertfordshire as a whole, until he committed suicide. He killed himself? Why? Well, he suffered from depression for many years and was said to have led a double life, part folklorist, part lawyer. And in the end, he jumped in front of a train at Hitchin train station. But he said, before he died, trespassers to Minston Chapel and sacrilegious persons take warning. For after my death and burial, I will endeavour in all ghostly ways to protect and haunt its hallowed Walls. Wait, so the ghost of this man is guarding the chapel? Yep, sometimes apparently dressed as a monk. <laughs> Just for fun? Yeah, well, Thomas Latchmore went there and took a photo of Reginald's ghost in this big monk's robe, which was published in several newspapers. And in later years, it has been reported that not only is he visible on Halloween, but other reported experiences include sightings of glowing crosses ghostly music, the ringing of long since stolen bells and the spectre of a murdered nun emerging from a secret tunnel that used to run from the Minsden Chapel to the nearby Dinsley Temple of the local Templar Order. Wow, so a proper supernatural hotspot. If you want to see dead people, go to Hitchin. Well, if you want to see ghosts of dead people, certainly. But for a very long time, if you wanted to actually see a dead person, you'd want to go to Stevenage to see the remains of Henry Trigg. And who on earth was Henry Trigg? Well, Henry was a local eccentric, a greengrocer, primarily, born in the 17th century, dying in 1726. But Henry was absolutely intent on not being buried underground, so he had it decreed in his will that his coffin should be placed in the rafters of his barn, a barn which, it's worth saying, still stands. So hold on, his coffin was put into the rafters of a barn? Yep, a lead-lined oak coffin with the barn first given by Henry Trigg to be used as a poorhouse, only it became a tourist attraction, then an inn, and right through to the 19th century, he was up there in his coffin while people had drinks and so on That's below. That's crazy. <laughs> yep. Things went wrong in World War I, however, when soldiers were billeted at the inn and they stole Henry Trigg's bones. <gasps> there were attempts made to have them returned, but basically whatever they did recover, it was decided to then bury those bones. After that, though, 
the hauntings began. Excuse me? Yep, this made it onto TV, by the way, and continued to be reported on through the post-war period. But yeah, in essence, it said Henry Trigg's ghost quite regularly appears in this barn and in his old house, walking through the walls. He's said to be shabbily dressed and about five foot eight inches tall, and he's looking for his body. Oh, I love it. So this old eccentric was happy for all the centuries when his coffin was on display in the rafters of his old barn. Yeah. But now he's upset. Yeah, exactly. The inn has now closed and the building, which is grade two listed, has been repurposed as Alliance Dental Practice. <laughs> but apparently it's still haunted with Henry Trigg, presumably all the more confused by people popping by to get root canals. Oh, poor Henry Trigg. <laughs> poor Henry Trigg. I must say there are tons and tons of ghosts and ghost stories from around Hertfordshire. So I've just picked some strange ones for this episode. Again, I'm sure you'll pick up on a load more next year. But before I get into my story, I can't not mention another legendary local hero, the one and only Piers Shonks. What is it with people from Hertfordshire having silly names? I know. Jack of Legs, Henry Trigg, and now Piers Shonks. <laughs> anyway, what did Piers Shonks get up to? Well, he was said to be the lord of the manor around Brent Pelham in the 10th and 11th centuries, at which time there was a dragon rampaging around the area. This was but one of his adventures. He's also said to have defeated another giant which lived in the woods in the nearby village of Barkway. Still, the dragon slaying is the really notable part. I mean, anyone who slays a dragon does need special praise and attention. In this case, though, it was no normal dragon. Oh, no. It was a dragon favoured by the devil himself and was one of the devil's pets. Is it bad that I think it's cute that the <laughs> devil has a pet dragon? Well, maybe. I mean, this dragon was said to live in a cave under the roots of an ancient yew tree that stood between two fields known as Great Pepsils and Little Pepsils. But in the way dragons do, it ate the local people's sheep, poisoned the water supply and gobbled up local villagers, meaning something had to be done. Come on, Shonksy, show that dragon what for. Well, indeed. So, determined to rid the district of the dragon, Shonks rode out, dressed in his full armour with his lance and his three favourite hounds, which were said to be so swift, it was as if they had wings. It said the dogs and peers chased the beast out from its lair and then hunted it across the countryside, where, after it landed, battle ensued. Only the dragon's scales were impervious to Piers Lance blows. What to do? Oh no, Piers Shonks! Actually, what am I saying? I don't care about Piers Shonks. The dogs! Somebody save the dogs! Well, eventually it said that those noble dogs locked their jaws onto the dragon's legs, making it roar, and when it did, Shonksy managed to thrust his spear right down the monster's throat, slaying the evil beast. Oh, I bet the devil didn't like that. He did not. He said to have then appeared in a path of sulfurous smoke, absolutely incandescent with rage, saying, Pierce Shanks, I will claim your soul, and to find it, I will search every church and graveyard in Hertfordshire every year until I find your corpse. And when I do, I will drag you down to hell. Oh dear, well, how's he going to get out of this one? Well, he found a workaround because he was a clever shonks. And so he was buried in the wall of the church, neither technically inside it or outside it. And we have to suppose the devil eventually gave up looking or got bored or something because in the 13th century, they added a black marble plaque on the wall there and in the 17th century an additional engraving which reads O Piers Shonks who died anno 1086 nothing of Cadmus or St George those names of great renown survives them but their fames time was so sharp set to make no bones of theirs nor their monumental stones but Shonks one serpent kills t'other defies and in this war as in a fortress lies this is amazing although actually quite terrible poetry terrible and also poetry. it seems to me that um the well-meaning person who put that up there 
has inadvertently advertised Piers Shonk's presence to the devil well, should he well, still exactly. be looking. Yeah, I know. Well, still, you can go and visit, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, what's, especially if you're the devil. <laughs> what's even more crazy in my mind is that the yew tree under which the dragon had its lair, that was still there right up until 1820. There's now a style on the spot for getting between the two fields. But how about that? Evidence, Helena. Evidence. Well, kind of evidence. <laughs> still, well done, Piers. And poor old devil always getting the wool pulled over his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> that guy going to catch a break? I know, right? Anyhow, I've checked my watch and, yep, yeah, it's high past story time, so let's get to it. My tale this week is called The Blind Fiddler of Ansi, and I'll start spinning my yarn right after this. Come on over, old friend. Take a seat. Yeah, bring your pint. Come on. Blimey, you look like you've seen a ghost. Not seen one so much as heard one, eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, that'll be Blind George, won't it? What do you mean you'd never heard of Blind George? Mate, listen, you've been living here for, what, ten years? And this is the first time? I mean, really. Learn the culture, mate. I've seen you banging nuggets in the fruit machine. You've been wasting your time. And if you'd asked, I'd have said, mate, never, ever walk through Northy Woods at night. You should know. Don't do it. Yeah, I know it's a shortcut from your place. I get it. But it's a bad idea. And I'll tell you why. See, it's an old story, this one, but a good one. So kick back. Now, this starts in the days of Bad King John, when there was a full-on castle here in Anstey. You know where it was, right next to the church. There's that huge mound of earth ringed by that pond. Yeah, mate, that's a moat. Wasn't always full of ducks. Still, there's nothing left of what it once was, save that mound, that duck pond and bits of the church. For if you look in St George's and... I know, you don't go to church, blah, blah. But if you go in, there's a coat of arms above the doorway, big shield, and then there's this old, old part, like there's the font with the four mermaids. Nobody knows how old that is. But the shield, the nave, all that, the stone, you can see is all different. And that's because it came from the castle. Now, the bloke who owned it was Nicholas de Anstey. The whole village, all this, was de Anstey lands. Maybe not a surprise the place is called Anstey. What do you mean, how do I know all this? Mate, I've lived here all my life. Plus, I like to read. You know, books. Remember them? From before you got into Candy Crush and became another Love Island, Strictly Come Dancing, Britain's Got Talent, Gogglebox solo act. Yeah, yeah. Look, mate, don't get argy. I've been in your house. There's no books anywhere. What do you mean, Jamie Oliver? Jamie Oliver isn't a book. That's a cookbook, mate. It's not the same. You're hilarious. Now, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Nicholas de Anstey's castle. Right, so, Nicholas de Anstey. He's a rich lord and a knight. A Norman. No, not like Norman the window cleaner. Like a French knight from Normandy. You're hopeless, mate. Just try and follow me. Nicholas de Anstey was a knight in the 1200s and, like a lot of knights, he wanted a son to carry on his family line. Only de Anstey didn't have a son. He had a daughter called Dionysia. Yeah, I know it's a weird name. It's old, named after the ancient god of wine and fertility and insanity. And the insanity part is important because the De Anstey's, mate, they were mental, all of them, to a man. Fine as kids, fine as they grew up, but the older they got, the stranger they became. And De Anstey had a sister, nobody knows her name, but he kept her locked up in that castle because of family shame and all that. Anyway, Nicholas' father dug a tunnel out from the castle all the way under the fields, under Northy Woods, right the way to a spot called Cave Gate. Yeah, you got it. Cave Gate Lodge, that massive mansion up on Big Inn Hill. Yeah, well, that's where it came out, this tunnel. It went all the way from Ansi Castle, right under the woods, under the fields, right by the new houses they built, then out at Cave Gate. 
and everybody knew that back in the day, old Nicholas's father, Herbert de Anstey, he dug the tunnel to sneak stuff in and out, and also to take his daughter out secretly so she could run about the woods and do whatever and nobody would see her. So, Nicholas, when his dad dies, all of a sudden it's his job to take his sister out. And down they go, walking through that tunnel, and it's a long tunnel. That walk isn't short. Still, he does it year after year, and people in the village, they start to know about it because this sister, everyone says she's a witch, that she gathers mushrooms and herbs and whatever and does black magic in Anstey Castle. Of course, it's no secret that Nicholas has his daughter, Dionysia, and Dionysia, sure enough, learns about witchcraft from her auntie, uses that tunnel to go out in the woods, and soon enough, she's meeting a boy in the woods, a local boy, a common boy, and when Nicholas finds out about it, he hits the flipping roof, and he's a knight, so he does a trick. He kidnaps that boy, drags him back through the tunnel, and that boy just disappears. Poof. Gone. Like a puff of smoke. Now, that only makes the rumours worse, and people from the village find the entrance to the tunnel, smash their way in, and sneak into the castle. Yeah, mate, I did say it is a good story. It's a good ones at last, isn't it? Anyway, so the villagers break in, flaming torches, pitchforks, they're a mob, mate. And Nicholas de Anstey, he has guards, there's a scrap, people die. Check the graveyard, there's stones there from people who died in this fight. But not everybody dies, and what the people find in that castle is all sorts of freaky stuff. Altars to the Dark Lord, sacrifices, magic cauldrons, it's all in there, and some of them manage to get away and tell everyone else about it. Afterwards, Nicholas de Anstey is known by everyone to have done a deal with the devil. His sister, his daughter, his wife, they're all witches and everyone knows it. Sure, de Anstey marries Dionysia after some lord in Kent, but things are never the same. People in the village, they're all planning what to do. Burn the castle, maybe. Do something when his lordship's out riding. Either way, de Anstey disappears one day, off to fight the Baron's Wars. And the next thing you know, the king himself, by now Henry III, has ordered Anstey Castle be taken down. Brick by brick they do it and those cursed stones from that castle are used to build the new end on old St George's church. Well yeah mate, that is exactly the question. What about the tunnel? Well, ever after, people in Anstey village know that tunnel as the Devil's Hole and they call it that because the old Deansteys had their deal with old Scratch, see? And people believed for years and years that anyone who went through the devil's hole would meet the devil himself down there, or one of the old witches, or one of their ghosts, or whatever. Point was, it was cursed, and for years and years, nobody would ever go down into the cave gate and walk the devil's hole. Only, yeah, of course, someone did. Yeah, and that's the point of the story. Yeah, mate. Do you want me to tell it or not? All right, then. Let me tell it, then. So. All right, Sandra. How's the kids? Yeah, all good, all good. Nah, I'm all right. I'm still drinking this one. Ah, So where was I? Oh, yeah. Hundreds of years go by. Literally hundreds. Then, sometime in the 1800s, this pub we're sat in, Back then, it's called the Checkers, right? And it's called the Checkers because it also used to be the old bank. This is where people came to keep their money. Travellers stabled horses. It was the full deal. And like a lot of places, Anstey had an old church band. Local people, some singers, some scraping the cello, another tooting on the hot boy, so on. With the best of the bunch in Anstey at the time, being Blind George the Fiddler. Now, Blind George was blind from birth, right? Lived all his life that way, never married, but 
he had a big old dog called Trumpeter. And people said the devil had done a deal with old George back in a past life, where he'd sold his sight to be born with a gift for music. This isn't the first time people did things like that. Italian bloke Paganini, he'd done it, sold his soul for skill with the violin. Another one, Tartini, he was the same. And people said back in the day, the fiddle was the devil's instrument, old Nick's favourite, see? They also said that if a fiddler was really good enough, he could make any woman fall in love with him, capturing her soul through music. Blind George, he wasn't like that. He was a good old boy. Went to church, said his prayers, went everywhere with old Trumpeter, who was his best friend. But even George, from time to time, came close. He'd play here at the checkers in this room, and he'd work those strings with his fingers, tap his toes, and the people would go crazy. Literally, they would lose their minds. And because he couldn't see... He didn't know. He'd just play and play, and sooner or later, hours would have gone by. It was said he'd come to, always, because Trumpeter would bark and bark to make him stop. But when Blind George stopped playing, and everyone who'd been dancing and jigging stopped wheeling about, they'd wake up as if from a daze with no memory of the hours from when Blind George started playing to when he'd stopped. No, yeah, I, I realise that isn't what happens when you listen to Banana Rama or Culture Club. Still, mate, ask about. People never forgot about Blind George. That's why this pub is called The Blind Fiddler. It's named after him. But not because he was so good at music. Nah. Blind George is remembered because he's the very last person who ventured down into the devil's hole. This all came about because people said to him, George, you're devilish good with your fiddle. Maybe old Scratch himself would like to hear your music. And it was a joke. But like a lot of jokes, it went on and on and on and on. Year after year, people said, George, go down into the devil's hole. Walk the tunnel. If anyone will be safe down there, it will be you. And the devil won't take you, he'll just dance to your music, and before you know it, you'll come out the other end. Eventually, they did a deal with him, made an agreement, said, if you walk that tunnel, we'll all chip in and keep you in pie and ale for the rest of your days. Now, Blind George liked the sound of that, as did Trumpeter, who was partial to a bit of steak and ale, as any dog is known to be. And people knew the route to walk as every winter when it snowed, you could see the outline of the tunnel through the woods and across the fields. That's because when the snow fell, it always melted along the line of the devil's hole on account, people said, of the patches of hellfire burning down below. No, mate, you don't have to believe me. You can literally look with your own eyes. Next time it snows... Go and have a look. You can walk all the way along it across the surface. But Blind George, he didn't just walk along on top. He went under. The whole village thought it was all fun and games. They all went out to the cave gate like a mob, dancing to Blind George's fiddle. They walked and they hopped and everyone was merry. But when they got to the cave gate, they cleared the opening, which years back had been blocked with stones and Trumpeter barked and barked. People brought shovels, see, with the plan being George would play his fiddle all the way down the tunnel and above ground people would follow the music knowing where he was. Trouble would come at the other end as the way up into the castle mound was lost years back. But as soon as they heard blind George's fiddle down in the earth there, they'd dig the entrance out again pull him up and that would be that pie and ale guaranteed for life everybody laughed when blind george went into the devil's hole and they laughed as he played his violin jigging and reeling about on the earth above ground the rest of the church band came too and they sang and played to the tune he fiddled and the first verse they sang it went the devil swapped my eyes for song in 1756 to free me from the chains of life. 
though I'm doomed to his pits. I'm bound to feel his tongs one day, but till I meet my doom, I'm a blind old fiddler who's never far from home. And on they danced and jigged, the ladies dancing and lifting their skirts, swirling them about, and the gentlemen hopped and skipped, and those who brought shovels clanged them in time along with the second verse. I've been to the cunning woman who lives along the lane. She looked to raise my curse from me, but nothing could I gain. She told me that I'd never see, and it's no use to mourn. I am a blind old fiddler who's never far from home. They crossed the field, the banks of the river Quinn, twinkling as the sun went down, and blind George played and played, and they heard Trumpeter down in the earth barking and barking, joining in with the third verse of the song. I have no wife or little ones to fuss or bother me. I'm spared from all those troubles, whatever they may be. My footsteps ever careful, while I'm compelled to roam. I am a blind old fiddler who's never far from home. Then they moved into Northy Woods, and that's where it happened. Of course, above ground, all was merry, and on they sang. But as they did, only a couple of them heard it. The wild screech of blind George as his bow scraped across his violin. Ah, they kept singing. So while my fingers dance along these narrow catgut strings, let's pour a drink and never think of dark or evil things. Come jig and dance unto my song, you'll never hear me moan. I am a blind old fiddler who's never far from home. But when that verse was finished, the rest of them realised Blind George had stopped playing. And they heard trumpeters bark, not below their feet, but racing back along the tunnel down the way they'd come. And the villagers, well, they didn't dig down, oh no. They ran, sprinted back through the trees, back across the fields, back to the cave gate. Once there, they found Trumpeter all right. Poor animal. His tail was gone and his fur all burned away, skin all singed. Some said the dog's eyes were burnt out. Whatever the case, sad old creature ran off into the night, howling, almost like the lords of hell were behind him. They found the dog dead the next day, drowned in the river. And the villagers waited for blind George to come back out, but he never did. So, the priest came and blessed the tunnel, and they put the stones back. Then they went so far as to brick it up to stop others going down or whatever was down there coming up. But as you felt walking here, if you go through Northy Woods around nightfall and you wander about over that tunnel, it said you'll know if his ghost is down there. You'll feel it on your skin, in your heart, in your guts. And from time to time, just like you did, You'll hear Blind George down there playing his fiddle, scratching out the devil's tune. And that's that. Now, I've told you a lovely story, and I must say, my throat is feeling mighty dry. <sniffs> oh, yep, see, I desperately need something to wet my whistle. How about it then, chum? Go on, up to the bar. I reckon it's your round. That was a very intriguing story, Martin. Is the tunnel definitely there? Yeah, the tunnel's definitely there. And has anybody ever unbricked it to explore what's down there? Well, at one end now, there's this very grand house. Oh my goodness. And then the other, which leads into the village and the mound where the castle used to be, I mean, they don't know where the entrance there would be. So you could theoretically dig along somewhere. But apparently, when it snows... You can see where, where exactly you can to see dig. it goes, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm surprised nobody's actually wanted to explore down there just to find... I suppose the story of Blind George has put them off somewhat. Well, definitely. You don't want to let whatever is down there out again. I mean, I wonder if he just... Maybe the air was bad. Maybe. Who knows? But the thing about the dog running out, yeah, all scorched, and the dog being all burnt, having that's lost its tail, quite frightening, yeah, isn't it? That's in in all the versions of this story wow. going back, and the pub 
in Anstey is called The Blind Fiddler after this event. So this really happened. Well, we think it really happened. We think it really Something happened. Something happened. Yeah, definitely. And it's the, the place where George stopped playing yes. marked in the, any way. It, well, I mean, there is this Northy Woods. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know if they have any There's memorials to him. And here, below here, George was swallowed by the devil. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should go on a field trip. Um, <laughs> mm, yes, uh, let's not go into the tunnel. <laughs> let's not try and uh, draw the attention of old Scratch too much. <laughs> OK, all right, fair enough. <laughs> Great story, though. Well, well thank done. you very much. So, Elena, shall we talk correspondence? Yes, please. OK, well, alas, no new comments on Spotify and no new review on iTunes or Apple oh, Podcasts. No, no new review. <laughs> People not love us anymore. I'm sure they're all just very busy. <laughs> that said, dear listener, if you haven't already written us a review, do please hop onto iTunes or Apple Podcasts and write us one. Each one really does help other people find the podcast. Likewise, wherever you listen to us, please do drop some stars or give us a thumbs up. Every little bit really does help. It sure does. And I have to admit, I've been a lot less active on social media this week. Apologies, life has sort of got in the way a bit, but I'll be back on it again very soon. Nonetheless, we have had some lovely messages, including from Evan, who's been getting into our Something Wicked episodes. Thank you very much for letting us know what you think, Evan. Oh, we hope you enjoyed last week's Gilles de Ray episode, Evan. What a crazy story. I know, right? All a bit mad. Joan of Arc, demons, child murder. Had a bit of everything, that one. Thank you also to Overoth and Michelle for your lovely comments on the Three Ravens blog. Very much appreciated those. And yes, Overoth, the 18th century poet Christopher Smart also did have a most excellent cat called Geoffrey to whom he wrote a poem. I think Geoffrey the cat therefore becomes the official third third favourite Three Ravens Geoffrey after Geoffrey of Monmouth at number one obviously and Geoffrey Chaucer at number two knocking Geoffrey from the British kids programme Rainbow off the podium but if you dear listener feel we have a special folkloric Geoffrey we're not giving enough focus to email us at three ravens podcast at gmail.com we want your Jeffreys. <laughs> thank you also to Paul and Andrea two Staffordshire locals for your kind words about last week's Staffordshire episode and Paul it may well be that you spend a lot of time roving about on Canuck Chase but please do be careful of the black eyed children <laughs> the rumours you said you'd heard from other people in the area are likely true look behind you right now the black eyed children might be right there See, now, Eleanor has been doing that to me all week. And every time she says it, every time I have to look, it's mean. You keep freaking me out. Whenever I've gone out, I've sent him a text saying, the children are behind you. you have, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's better to be safe than sorry. Mm. It's also worth saying there's only one more week to get those entries into our folklore flash fiction competition. Send us a thousand words of folkloric writing, any topic, any theme. Still, make it honed and tight as a tiger. Then email it to us at three ravens podcast at gmail.com by next monday for inclusion in our folkloric flash fiction contest yep we'll be going through all the entries and picking out our favorites to give dramatic readings in special episodes that will come out between series three and series four goodness Eleanor! series four we need to get a planning we do luckily <laughs> after next week we'll have a bit of a break and some time to plan things as for our likers commenters and super sharers this week particular thank yous go to eric I am Nellie Kelly, Pete, Dominic and Alan on Facebook, Cerulean Esk, Sam Logan, Tracy, Juan and Rach Egg on Instagram, and Kathleen, C.R. Sheridan, the Myth and Monsters podcast, and the one and only Paco Garcia on Twitter. Really glad you enjoyed the White Stag episode on Patreon, Paco. Martin, that story was just too much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if you're not on Patreon, boy, are you missing out <laughs> on that one. Eric and Enid on Adventures, and I've got to say, the recording took quite a long time because I was just wetting myself laughing the yeah. whole way through and interrupting <laughs> you, you it. Were. Anyway, thank you so much. And if you'd like to join the fun on social media, please flap your ink dark wings over to facebook.com forward slash three ravens podcast in Instagram at Three Ravens Podcast or Twitter at Three Ravens Pod. And thank you so much to everyone on the Three Ravens Podcast group. Maria, Michelle, David, Dominic, Sabrina, you guys are all the best. And blimey, Charlie, the end is near, Martin. Oh, on Thursday, we have our final bonus episode of the series, our Leap Day special. Yeah, won't be able to do another one of those for another four years, so it ought to be pretty special. <laughs> um, and then next Monday, it's Series 3 finale time. You're taking us to Norfolk. I am. One of the most 
folklore drenched mystical counties in all of England. And for that very special episode, marking the end of our first lap around all 39 counties, I will be telling my take on the legend of Black Shuck. Oh my goodness. You've been holding off, including dogs in stories, waiting to offer us the ultimate demonic hellhound tale of all. I can't wait. Yeah, he's kind of dog prime, isn't he? <laughs> he is, yeah, yeah. I am nervous, but very excited. Well, me too. In the meanwhile, though, while our story's gone that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle till you're out of the woods. Thanks and credit go to Doris Jones Baker's book, Tales of Old Hertfordshire, W.B. Jerish's book, The Folklore of Hertfordshire, and Betty Puttock's book, The Ghosts of Hertfordshire, all of which were very useful in my research for this episode. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our logo is by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, written and produced by me. Martin Fox, thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean men, with a down, derry, derry, derry.